Come on, Brooksy. <laughs> hey, how are you? Great to be here. Great, how are you? I've been looking forward to this for weeks, Chris. Uh, well, you've been here before. I of have, course and that's you why have. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we love you. This book is out now, The Art and Science of Getting Happier. Build the life you want. Arthur C. Brooks, along with his mate, Oprah Winfrey. Let's have the quick Oprah chat. How would you meet? Um, when did you move in together? Do you think you'll stay together forever or what? <laughs> it's... it's uh, <laughs> It's interesting. During the coronavirus epidemic, it turns out that Oprah Winfrey was reading my column, my weekly column in The Atlantic called How to Build a Life, which is about the science of happiness. Incredible. You never know who's reading your column. Half a million Americans read it. It could be anybody. It turns out Oprah Winfrey. She calls up and says, this is Oprah Winfrey. And I'm like, yeah, and this is Batman. No, no way. It turns out it was Oprah Winfrey. It was actually Oprah Winfrey. And she wanted to maybe work together to introduce these ideas more widely. And so we, when's the first time you met Oprah? I met her a few weeks. Well, I did her podcast remotely. She was in Hawaii, right. her place in Hawaii. And then we did a television show together remotely. And then I went out and, and to had dinner with her at her place in Montecito, California. What was that like? It was great. <laughs> it was great. It was, it was wonderful. And then after oh, that, great. and then we cooked up this book and I stayed at her place for a few days. And, and she has a nice guest room, I got to tell you. What did you have to eat? <laughs> I don't remember. I remember what? the conversation. I don't remember what he had to the, <laughs> What was the conversation? The it was headlines. just all about, you know, how we could use these ideas right, to right. lift up millions of people. She's a doer, isn't she? she? Well, she's also brilliant. Yeah. She's one of the few people, you know, in my line of work, I've been very lucky. I meet a lot of people who are in public life. Most really famous people, I mean, She's beyond famous. One of the, probably the five most famous Americans. Yeah. M maybe in the world. Who Ever, knows? Yeah. That, that they're usually different in public and private. Oprah Winfrey's the same person. <sighs> How? Why? Because she's actually, she understands that the reason that she has fame and fortune is to lift other people up and bring them together. And she's always done that. Absolutely. And people trust her and they should. And that's how we came together because that's my scientific endeavor. Lift people up and bring them together in bonds of happiness and love using science and ideas. Love it. And she said to you that if she still had a TV show, you'd be on it 30 times and then you'd have your own TV show. Yeah. But of course... We don't need that nowadays, do we? Because there's no. the podcasts and there's yeah. shows like this. It's just media is different than it used to be. Good. The idea dissemination, the ecosystem of information is completely different than it used to be. Right. Now, you, uh, you and I know, because you tell me and I agree with you, that Oprah is a judge. Yeah. Um, what am I referring to here? You're referring to Arthur? the PANIS test, positive yes. affect, negative affect sequence, which is the best personality test based not on what your emotions are, but the intensity of their po of your positive and negative emotions. The test is in the book. It's also on my website at arthurbrooks.com. You can take it for free. Yeah. And you'll find that, that you're one of four types of people emotionally, and that'll tell you a lot about yourself. There's my scores. Your scores. Chris <laughs> Evans is a mad scientist. Well, I am a mad scientist. I thought I'd be a cheerleader. Uh, so let's just quantify what, how, what the metrics point towards cheerleaders, mad scientists, judges, or posts. How, how might they work just briefly? Okay, the way that this works is that everybody has above or below average affect, positive and negative, a.k.a. You have happy feelings, you have unhappy feelings. The unhappy and happy feelings can be above or below average in intensity. If you're an intense intensely happy person and an intensely unhappy person, Chris Evans, then you are a <laughs> mad scientist. If you're intensely happy and, and, and weakly unhappy, you're a cheerleader. Yep. If you're weakly on both, you're a judge. Uh -huh. And if you're intensely unhappy and weakly happy, you're a poet. <sighs> Gosh, it's exhausting. It's not exhausting. It's exhausting for me because I thought I was going to be a cheerleader. You exhaust yourself yeah. because that's what mad scientists do. Oh, By no. the way, they're also great radio hosts. Are they? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, work in progress, everyone. Um, so, <laughs> so far, so good. I saw I, the numbers. <laughs> I thought I was going to be a cheerleader, right? Yeah. And then I did the test, and then I turned out to be a mad scientist, which you knew. Yeah. But I think secretly I might be a poet because I think I might have lied about the positive scores. Is that Or is that a mad scientist trait as well? That's a mad scientist trait, absolutely. <laughs> no, the, here's the thing. For you to keep the energy up hours and hours a day on yeah. this show, uh -huh. you have to be in... Your, your, your emotions have to be incredibly salient. Yes. There's no way that a judge could build an audience like this and keep the energy up on this show. Mm -hmm. That's the reason that people in media that are live in media every single day, yes. also CEOs, entrepreneurs, they tend to be mad scientists. But Letterman, famously, he wouldn't be a mad scientist. Would no, he? probably not. He'd and he had this judge. kind of would laconic he be, style. Would he be a poet? 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know him, actually. But yeah. I would say that he's probably, yeah. And, and by the way, Oprah Winfrey is not a mad scientist. And she did a show every day. She's a judge. But what she was doing is she was bringing a lot of mad scientists onto yeah, her yeah, show. Yeah. And she was using that as a particular platform. That was her particular genius. So we have a judge over here. Sinead is a judge. Are you a judge? Say I'm hi a to judge. the judge. That means yeah. low, low. And, and God knows we need judges because they keep us grounded and sane. I mean, that, that's why Oprah Winfrey and I work together so well. I'm the maddest of the mad scientists and she's a very she's a very low affect very equilibrated person and so we work together really really well you two work together cheerleader you? you're a cheerleader yeah sorry I'm, I'm slap bang. It doesn't sound like it at the moment. Yes. I didn't. I didn't. Yes. I didn't even know. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just. I just put all the scores in yeah. and, and like twos and ones on the negatives and fives pretty yeah, much yeah, across yeah. the board. Classic. Classic. You know. And and you know cheerleaders. They have the highest well-being scores in general. Oh. They do really really well on well-being. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. On the contrary. Are you married? Yep. Is your wife a cheerleader? Nope. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So here's the problem with two, when two cheer, she's a judge. Yeah. Yeah. She's a judge. Oh, that's a good combination. But when two cheerleaders meet, fall in love and get married, they always go bankrupt because they take out 13 credit cards. (laughs) What could go wrong? It'll be fine. It'll It'll work itself out. It's going to be great. What a blast. What a Uh love. No problem is, is, have you been married to a cheerleader before? Um, no. Have you been married to another mad scientist? Uh, yes. That blows up. Yeah, it did. Actually. Yeah, yeah. It goes. They spin each other up. Uh-huh. It's unbelievably wonderful. It's euphoria, and they bomb each other. Might judge now. Yeah, and then yeah. all the way down to the cellar. Um, you talk about happiness and not happiness, and right. that's because happiness is always attainable regardless of how you are. Happiness is hardly ever attainable. It, you know, it's it's a, almost the unicorn of of the piece, as it were. Well, yeah, yeah. Happiness is not is not a destination. We need negative emotions that keep us alive. Yep. Sadness, anger, fear, disgust. These are the things that have kept us alive in the place to see and still today. You get run over on your first day walking around London if you didn't feel fear. The truth is, you need <laughs> negative emotions, and those things make it impossible possible for you to attain perfect happiness and we have to stop trying happiness is a direction yeah. oprah winfrey calls it happy yearness yeah. is the goal and that's what we need to do and that's what the book is about it's your it's your handbook for happiness oprah winfrey your, your friend oprah winfrey well it's my co-author my partner in the, in the project it's, cool. it's so you're cool anyway but you just got ice cool because you she's like your mate she's your co-author she's your friend oh it's unbelievable she's great uh, now you don't score so well on happiness because you are you'd be more likely to be unhappy than happy yeah. not that it doesn't mean you can have a great life you, you can't have a great life rather uh, but you got to your mid 50s and there was a real sort of epiphany that right. you, what was that well i'm a social scientist dedicated to human behavior mm-hmm. and i you know that's what i did my phd in 30 years ago and i realized i actually wasn't using the science that i had learned for my own good i was i was talking did about you things realize that were it or did your wife realize well my wife kind of figured that one out i mean my, my wife says why don't you stop you know wasting your time and you use your phd for something useful and, and i was running a company i was running a big think tank in washington dc called the american enterprise institute and it was working with politicians and it was important i was raising money i was very unhappy and my wife said you got to do something this is this is this has got to change yeah. so i actually quit my job and dedicated myself to using science to lift other people up including myself bringing them together in bonds of happiness and love and that's what i've been doing for the past five years and my happiness is 60 percent higher than i know it was and you do this regular ago. test on yourself what's yeah. the test you do well there's a i have a battery of 15 tests that i do some of which are on my website and people can take and i take them sincerely i make all of my students take them but i have to take them every semester myself right. twice a year so and i see my own progress so this is real stuff one of which is the panis i love that panis personality yes, test. so do i a lot of insight into ourselves how we should complement ourselves how we should partner up yeah and how we should understand how we can manage our strengths and weaknesses right so um we are not talking specifically surgically about uh, bits in the book uh, you've got to get the book you can also listen to various podcasts steve bartley's podcast we've been playing the trail from that all morning diary of a Seer, all great stuff to get more from arthur c brooks and you oprah winfrey's... On audible by the way oprah and i will read it to you the oh. dulcet tones of our voices will, will that... load you to sleep at night did, did you alternate how does that work yeah so we both we we didn't actually weren't in the same studio but is we... it chapter a uh, chapter each or... no she 
she wrote she wrote a lot of the introductions to the chapters oh, right. her, actually. Her so her work wrapped around the science. Okay. Um, one thing you do allude to in the book, which I'm happy to sort of I'm happy to zoom in on all of it. We just don't have time. Uh, is that struggling and suffering are the daily lotto we can all win without buying a ticket, and it's the lotto we should be trying to yeah. win. Yeah, yeah. Back in the '60s, you know, the hippies used to say, "If it feels good, do it." You know, my my father heard that and said, "That's the end of America." <laughs> he was kind of right, but. The problem is that today, a lot of young people feel that if it feels bad, make it stop. Yeah. That if I'm suffering, I'm broken, I'm defective, I need treatment. The truth of the matter is that suffering is part of life. It's how you learn and how you grow. The negative emotions actually keep you, keep you alive. You have to manage them so they're not exaggerated and maladapted, but they're, they're, they're incredibly important. Suffering is sacred. I make my students repeat after me, my suffering is sacred. Because you cannot get to happiness except through unhappiness. That is a truth of life. These are not opposites. They're not antithetical. These are not orthogonal concepts that you can get one without the other. On the contrary, man, you got to be fully alive if you're going to get to happierness in this life. And so that's the obstacle is the way, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. That's uh, all life is suffering, but there is an end to suffering and there is a rightful and uh, righteous path to suffering. And, yeah. and that's where we go. And that's you get up every day and that's how we roll. And if you, if you don't think it is, then good luck out there because avoidance... Well, well, it's not good. It's avoidance is starving yourself of the oxygen of life. You will avoid your life. You'll yeah. effectively avoid your life if you're trying to run away from your suffering. And this is one of the worst pieces of advice that people you're in my age give to young adults. Yeah. Is that we say that if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling sad, then there's something pathological about you, something wrong with you. Well, on the contrary, you know, I teach students at Harvard University. This is a hard thing to get into. It's a hard thing to get out of. I say, if you're not anxious and sad, then you need therapy. The truth of the matter is that life is really tricky. Now, again, it can be exaggerated. It can be maladapted. You need to manage it so it doesn't manage you, but don't avoid it. You're such a great guest. <laughs> I was so looking forward to just sitting where I am now and witnessing exactly what I'm witnessing now because I knew this is what would happen. <laughs> it's uh, subversive, isn't it? Isn't it crazy? You'd say this to your parents, your grandmother. She'd say, well, the equivalent of, well, duh. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And But now we say it and it's almost as if we're you know blowing up these conventions, mm. these shibboleths of modern society. On the contrary, we're just saying these, this is common sense. And because the natural bent of, um, you know, big commerce is to sort of, uh, to, to comfort and, um, you know, incubate ourselves away from all the hardships yeah. or to buy ourselves out of discomfort. Um, and over into over being over convenienced because right. that's the way it's hard it's harder for us now to break out of this chrysalis isn't it and to to go out there and to to do hard things outside yeah. and to focus on our breathing you know and to put other people first because we're bred to be more narcissistic aren't we the instant gratification it, it you know it wakes us up our phones wake us up there you go that already they're in charge unless we sort of stop listening to ourselves and start speaking to ourselves mm -hmm. Absolutely. Look, the technology is also a real accelerant to this problem. People get up in the morning. The first thing they do is they 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 reach for the device. They that the chrysalis of of the social media bubble in which you're talking to, listening to people who agree with you, firing you up, never having to interact with other people in real life. You can date on 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 web apps where you you curate your profile such that you're basically dating the equivalent of your of your sibling, which yeah. is not hot. And and then we wonder why people are not not very attracted now, to you, each other. You know it's not hot because your kids tell you. Yeah, my kids tell me this. I have, I have adult kids. My kids are 25, 23, and 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they tell me exactly this. And so the result is that they rebel on the... It's interesting because my, my little girl is 20 and she's a psychology neuroscience major. And she's doing all this stuff in sort of the junior level of what I'm doing, but she's living it in real time. Yeah. My older kids rebelled on the basis of the science because they were steeped in this the whole time. And I, my, my sons are 25 and 23. One's a father. The other has a pregnant wife. I mean, they got married at 22 and 23 because they're rebelling against all of these trends that are that are ruining happiness in society for young people. So a lot of the algorithms on the some of the really famous dating sites are set up wrong. Going back to our mad scientist, poet, judge and cheerleader um, square. Um, do you think they do that on purpose? So you, because if the, if dating sites were really successful, 
people only need to use them once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're a mess because what you find people have more dates and less attraction. Yeah. People are dating more people, even meeting more people in real life on the basis of these apps, and they're less attracted to these partners. Mm. And and the reason for this is because we are narcissistic by nature. Yeah. And so when we're allowed to curate the, 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 the whole profile that we have for our dating, that we're looking for people who are too much like us. They vote like me. They like music like me. They like Indian food like me. They live in the same place. They see the world in the same Oh, it's me. Exactly right. And look, there's a lot of neurobiology that actually shows that we are attracted in yeah. all sorts of undetected ways, not to our, our the same person, but to somebody who's complementary to us. Mm. Incredibly important. The major histocompatibility complex, which is the repertoire of our ability to fight off diseases, means we need to marry somebody who's very different. We need to literally, physically embrace diversity. Yeah. So if we're plus, we need a minus. If we're minus, we need a plus. Uh, anywhere in between is fine. But a repetition is not good. It's it's bad because you are not attracted to people who are too much like you. Yeah. Oh, so important. On our brilliant trail that we've stolen, it's daylight robbery. We've stolen it from Stephen Bartlett, CEO, Diary CEO. His trail for you is, have you heard it? His, oh, the trailer for the for podcast you. that we did together. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's, it's very it's like well done. the biggest movie in the world. Here we go. I take the same tests year by year and I am 60% happier than I was five years ago because I finally cracked the code. Okay, so Arthur Brooks, the world renowned social scientist, Harvard professor, and best selling author. It goes on, it's like Arthur Brooks, the movie. I know. And it ends with this cliffhanger the four goals of happiness are boom. I know, boom. You gotta listen to the podcast. Well, come on, what are they now? Well done, Steve. Well, I, everybody has to go listen to the podcast, but <laughs> if they have, then they'll know yeah. that there's the habits of the happiest people. There's a thousand habits, but there's only four that really matter. Mm. So if we, we want to get the satisfaction and the enjoyment and the meaning in life, m maximally we need faith, family, friends, and work. By faith, I don't mean a specific religious faith. Mm -hmm. I'm a Catholic, very important to me. But as a social scientist, I can say there are many paths to transcendence, which means, and not necessarily even religious faith, something that makes you little and the universe big so that you have perspective and finally have peace from the constant <laughs> psychodrama in the head of, you know, my lunch and my car and my commute and my money, me, yeah. me, my me, garden, me. My garden my accountant, it's so my awful. doctor. It's so tedious. It's so boring. It's like watching the same episode of the same television show over and over and over right, again. Okay. So if you can zoom out through stoic philosophy, walking before dawn without devices, um, uh, listening to the fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach or starting a Vipassana meditation practice or practicing the faith of your youth, you will get that. That's number one. Second is family. <laughs> Mystical relationships that you didn't choose. Yes. And God knows you wouldn't have <laughs> in so many cases, right? There's no substitute for that. And we actually understand the neurobiology of how it works. The oxytocin that we actually get from bonding with our kin has no replacement in our happiness equation. Super important. One in six Americans is not talking to a family member because of politics today. I'm sure it's the same here in the UK. That's not going to improve this year, it's, is it? It's hot. Oh, yeah, the states. <laughs> but don't let that look. It's just politics, man. That is yeah. not abuse. Oh, you know, you disagree with me. You're trying to erase my existence as my identity. My no, 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 no. That's Aunt Marge. I don't care if she likes or hates Trump. She still would take your phone call at 3 a.m. if yeah. you were in distress. She still make, makes the best peak and pie around. Uh, don't <laughs> screw it up. Yeah, and then uh, and then uh, uh, friendship. You know, look. I mean, it's a lot of people that I deal with. I work with a lot of leaders. They have millions and millions and millions of deal friends and no real friends. Yeah, I like this. Real and deal, man. And we all actually know the difference. And last but not least, it's work. And there's only two things to do, which you're doing with your show every single day, yeah. which is lifting people up and bringing them together. That's service and earning your success. I mean, look, you earn your success. There's merit. You understand that you're creating value. Yeah. There's numbers that show you you're creating value. But ultimately, what you're trying to do is to serve other people so that they can have a, a better commute to work, more ideas so they can have a better life. And all of us deserve to be able to feel those things, earn success and serving others. Tell us about the improved meaning that success gives fortune. Well, so meaning is a really interesting area of life. It's one of the hardest things. And you find that the people who are least happy or, or most in search of happiness and not finding it, they, they have an emptiness, a hollowness with respect to the why question of their lives. They know the what. Oh, I have a job. You know, I go to school, whatever it is. The why part is really hard. And there's two questions. There's a, a test if, if you have a meaning crisis in your life. Question, I, I will know on the basis of not your answers, but whether you have answers. Okay. Why am I alive? And for what am I willing to give my life on this day? And if that's like, I don't know, well, that's a problem, but it's also an opportunity. Now you know what to go in search of. You don't have to go and sit in the mouth of a cave with a guru in the, in the Himalayas. Look for the answers to the questions. Why am I alive? Who created me? Maybe 
What am I on earth to do? And for what would I give my life at this moment voluntarily? And when you find the answers to those questions, it'll be a miracle. Your life will have a different aspect to it. You'll be, you'll be fuller than you've ever been before. Yeah. That's what to look for. I've seen it in my own kids. I've Tell seen us it. about the virality of happiness and other things. Yeah, this is a emotional contagion. This is really important. So our brains are made to live in community. We have these things called mirror neurons, where if I'm looking at you right now and you're an incredibly infectiously positive person, <laughs> and part of the reason is because you're used to trying to get guests fired up. You don't need a boring guest on the Chris Evans show. That's not going to work. And so the result is you're trying to give me energy and you are. How? Through your facial expressions, through the, your cadence, the way that you talk. And my brain is reading your brain. Now that's great. But if you go home to tonight and you're kind of bummed out, you'll bring other, other people down as well. And this is really important. All of us have the ability, the opportunity, not the privilege to use emotional contagion to lift other people up by being happy first. Yes. This is why you have to put on your own oxygen mask when it comes to happiness before you try to help those around you, as they say on the airplane. The most important thing that you can do to make other people happier is to get happier. Okay. Um, talking about happiness, about being happy and about the fact that it, is, that it isn't a thing, but there are suggestions of it. There are clues to it. You know, as tastes give you an idea of what you might be eating, right. there is evidence of happiness, even though it may be sort of far off away. Don't chase it because it'll run, well, it right. won't run away, it doesn't exist. It's like it'll, it won't disappear in a puff of smoke. It is a puff of smoke, if you like. What, what is the evidence around us that will make us sense? You say happiness isn't a feeling or yeah. happiness is happiness not, a, not feeling. a feeling. And Tell this is really, that. really important. Most people think that happiness is a feeling. It's how I feel when I'm with the people that I love. That, that's wrong. That's like saying that the smell of your dinner is is your dinner. Right. And, and you know, your smell of the dinner is evidence that there's going to be a good dinner, but the, the smell were everything would be very disappointing, to be sure. The feeling of happiness is evidence of happiness. You have to pursue something tangible, and that comes in three parts. Those are macronutrients. And you and I are, in, are, are nutrition nerds and exercise nerds. <laughs> Why? Because we're 60, and that means we have to be or bad things happen. You know, <laughs> look around. It yeah. is not good. So you have to balance your macronutrient profile of protein, carbohydrates, and fat, et cetera. Yes. Same thing is true for happiness. Happiness has three macronutrients, enjoyment, satisfaction, meaning. Those are the three things that you need to pursue. And each of them has a huge scientific literature and a lot of lessons around it about how to do that. That's a huge part of what I write about. Enjoyment is not pleasure. Don't search for pleasure. That'll lead you to addiction and problems. But if you take pleasure and add people and memory, then it becomes a truly human experience. And that's enjoyment. So what I tell my students, students and my kids, for example, is if something gives you pleasure and, and it can be addictive, never do it alone. The rule is take the source of pleasure, but make sure you add people and memory. Don't gamble alone. Don't drink alone. Don't eat a, eat a whole wedding cake alone. But you say, so if you gamble with other people and drink with other people, that can be better. That can, that's a, that can be a source of enjoyment. Now, if all your friends are drunks, that's a problem. Right. Right. But the whole point is. I tried is, that. But we, <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to ask you this thing. I tried it with other people. It was still yeah. really bad for me. It was me. still really because you had the wrong friends. I but was, the whole point okay, is. That, I went low. Yeah. If you, <laughs> but if you're. If, but if you're doing something that's in community mm. and it's enhancing the sense of community and love and, and, and relationship you're having with other people, it'd be a source of enjoyment. Why? You're taking the, the pleasure, which is an ancient animal signal in the limbic system of your brain, which was fully developed two million years ago, and you move it through community with memory and relationship to the prefrontal cortex. That's the executive center of your brain, the bumper of tissue right behind your forehead. It's 30% of your brain by weight. That's only 250,000 years old. Then you'll be able to manage what you're doing with that, and it will become a source of memory and experience and enjoyment. That's the critical thing, is that's why, you know, you never see a beer commercial of a guy pounding a 12-pack in his house by himself in the dark, because that's sad. And <laughs> you wouldn't see anybody that well, It doesn't lead to <laughs> happiness. But you'll see the guy opening a beer with his brother. Community! Yeah, and, and friends. Camaraderie. at a, a sporting event. And, you know, what are they saying? Beer plus people plus memory equals enjoyment, and that's part of happiness. Yeah, but that's you can take critical. away the bits, people plus people. Totally, Doing totally. great things, you know, getting high on their own supply, as it were. Uh-huh, yeah, Far for sure. Yeah, tick. for sure. And here's the key thing. That's what you find out. If, you're, if you've ever been addicted to any substances, you realize that what you really wanted was love. 
and that the substance was that it was a substitution for the love. It's a substitute yeah. for the love that you sought. And then what you need is what you needed was what you needed to do with that substance in the first place, mm. which was to add the people and the experiences that would actually give you a full life. You can even take away the substance. Yeah. And 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 you can be okay. Now, of course, you change your brain, et cetera, et cetera. There's problems involved in that. But that's the whole point. Anyway, that's the that's the science of enjoyment, the neuroscience of enjoyment, satisfaction and meaning. They they have big theory and they have big evidence around them, but we can all use the science to live a better life. You don't have to be some nerd with a PhD. Okay. Awesome. You are awesome. So um, Michael Singer says that when you decide to do something that's good for you, not good for you, consume something that's bad for you, good for you, hang around with people who are bad for you, good for you. Actually, you always want the same thing. It's just, you just want to be happy. Yeah. And those decisions, you sometimes delude yourself into thinking you're chasing success or you're chasing money or you're chasing a partner or, or whatever it is. But actually, it's all the same flavor. Pretty much. And so one of the things that we find is that part of the problem with all of that is the world tells us that we, there are shortcuts to love and happiness. There's no shortcuts to love and happiness. People say that if I'm just successful, if I make a bunch of money or I have power or I have a bunch of temporary pleasure or I have a million Instagram followers, then, then, I'll, then I'll be happy automatically. That's completely wrong. Those things are nothing more than, than temporary way stations on the way to happiness. You can use money to make a happier life, but you can't get money from, happy, from happiness from money. That's really critical for us to understand. It's the, there's nothing wrong with money, but it's incomplete is the whole thing. So the world lies to us. Mother Nature lies to us. It's not capitalism is the problem. It's yeah. Mother Nature that puts into our brains that if we get, if we do these things that will help us survive and pass on our genes, then we'll be happy. Mother Nature does not care if Chris is happy. Mother Nature wants Chris to have, to survive another day and have 75 children. <laughs> That's what Mother Nature wants. <laughs> Gave it a go. Uh, five. <laughs> so, so well just, done. So, you're, thank we, you. Thank uh, you. You're, you're, you're your descendants shall be as numerous as the stars thank you, in the thank sky. You. And we're both we're both grandfathers. God, we are. We're it's so the, blessed. It's, it's this is a game changer yeah, for for, yeah. for happierness. It's a whole a conversation, a different conversation for a different day. Um, you can decide to be happier. It is a yeah. decision. You can make that decision. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it. But it's always there if you want to. Yeah, and it's not as simple as, you know, when I see somebody who has a bumper sticker on the car, which we always do in the States, it's very, it's very tacky, but we do this a lot. It says, choose happiness. I want to, I want to speed up and ram my car into that person <laughs> because it actually isn't that simple. Is that nudging them to happen? Yeah. Nudging them to happiness. The choice <laughs> of happiness requires that you do the work. Yeah. It's not just a, hey, I woke up today and I said I was going to be really bummed out or I was going to be really happy. And so I chose happiness because I'm not an idiot. No, we would all do that if it were that simple. You have to do the work. Work. That means you have to understand what we're talking about here and you have to change your habits. These are life choices to learn and to and to change your behavior. And that takes actual work. And if you really want to nail it down, then you got to share it with other people because that will install the ideas permanently in the in the in the executive centers of your brain and you will own it for the rest of your life. In other words, understand change share yeah or oh, it's teaching isn't it it's, it's yeah. the same um chapter four we've got to talk about chapter four everybody always talks about chapter four i'm going to do the same thing it's about um it's about uh, volunteering helping other people out being selfless yeah. being kinder yeah it's key isn't it? it it really is i mean one of the most important things that, to keep in mind is that if you want love go give love yeah that's what it comes down to always give the thing that you want to get this is a real law of 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 sort of magnetism if i you know when people are feeling lonely they have a a really counterproductive tendency to cocoon to watch netflix in a fuzzy blanket with a tub of haagen and it's unhelpful get out of the house call a friend when you're when you move to a new place my students are all going on the market they're all mba students they're going to move to far-flung locations they're going to be lonely when they get there the strategy for when you're feeling lonely is to pretend that you're not and look for somebody who is and help them in other words the first week that you move to a place as soon as your furniture shows up invite somebody over for dinner and you'll find that, that that you're not lonely anymore. Start a book club in your first month in your new place. Pretend you are the person that you want to be and you will become that person. Tell us about the ghost phone. The ghost phone. This is a very interesting phenomenon that happened after the after the tsunami in Japan where you know 10,000 people lost their lives. That, that people needed to connect somehow with their lost loved ones. So a, 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 an artist set up a phone booth in Japan in, in, in sight of the areas that were devastated by the tsunami. And the phone wasn't hooked up. 
<laughs> what it did was actually it was recording messages from people, but it wasn't hooked up to anything. They went in and they were supposed to record messages on this phone to their dead loved ones. 35,000 people did this. They, and, and it was heartrending. This is a place that it's a very low affect society. And, you know, in Japan, it's not like in the States where we're, you know, bursting all the time and yelling and being overtly emotional. In Japan, people are quite reserved. And, but what they found was that people were very open about their sadness and their happiness and their happy memories and their sadness memories and and the recordings of these incredible messages that people gave to their 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 dead loved ones were extraordinary enough but when they talked to the people afterward they found that they felt better because they're able to say the things they hadn't said in real life um we are sadly running out of time a couple of uh, we are a couple of yeah couple we've of only fun. been talking for 45 seconds i know it's mad isn't it um tell us about you have some fun things about couples couples happiness yeah. about about what women expect men to do after they've they're married and what men expect women to do and actually the opposite occurs. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one of the interesting things that you find that everybody, by the way, I mean, marriage is a complicated business, but not as complicated as we make it. One of the biggest problems that we have is we want passion to last forever. The goal of marriages is, is, is friendship. And so what happens is there's this cascade neurophysiologically that's happening where we're attracted to each other through sex hormones and then there's and there's neuromodulators that give us euphoria and a sense of anticipation to be together. And then our, our, our serotonin levels dip. It looks like clinical depression because we have to ruminate on the other person, which bonds us, imprints us of the other person. And then at the end of the day, if all goes well... You, you're, you're permanently bonded to the other person with oxytocin, which is a, a neuropeptide that makes you somebody into your kin. That's when you're friends for life, and that's the goal. When people actually will be passionately in love and find they hate each other three years later, the reason is because they never got to step four. They never actually got to the friendship phase. So all the young people who are listening to us or all the old people who are starting out with another relationship, again, the goal is friendship, not permanent passion. And most people actually misunderstand that. And also Often men get together with a woman and think they can change. No, they think the woman's going to stay the same. Yeah, What's that? Yeah, What's yeah. that? And and women think that the they, they think they can change the husband, and they're disappointed when they can't. The man thinks that the woman's going to stay the way she was when he married her forever, and they're disappointed when she doesn't. <laughs> so we, we end up doing the opposite. It's so A lot. I mean, that's a very common yeah. gender-based pattern. And oh what you have God. to understand is, look, your life is going to bend like a river. Yeah. Your spouse's life is going to bend like a river. Yeah. Bend together. Yeah. When the change is more, if she's actually becoming more religious, become more religious. Yeah. If he's suddenly starting to vote for the Tories, it's okay. I mean, don't go, don't let your rivers bend differently from each other because the most important thing that you can have is actually this intimacy that comes from your very best friend. Best friendship through permanent romantic partnership is truly the greatest source of happierness that we can get in this life. All right, we have just over a minute left. So Oprah invented the word happiness, which is great. It's a fantastic word. It's one I use all the time. I've been seeing it, first of all, from your mouth, not hers, and now reading it in your book. She also invented the word Arthurisms. <laughs> Uh, because she loves your authorisms. We literally have a minute left. Can you give us three authorisms that people can take with them today, if you don't mind? Okay. Um, Arthur, so, so let's talk about the three mistakes that everybody's going to make with happiness. Happiness, we've said this before, we'll say it again, it's important. Happiness is not a feeling. Right. Number two, Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy. So if you follow your animal nature, you will take it down into the cellar of your own happiness. Right. De follow the true human, maybe even the divine path which is really important. For example, want less, don't have more, yeah. which is one of the things that Mother Nature doesn't want you to know, but it's really, really important. And yeah. last but not least, remember that your happiness is not a destination. It's very important for you to, to understand the sacredness of your suffering, that your happiness lies through the path of unhappiness. Happiness is a direction. It's a direction that we can take and make progress on for the rest of our okay. lives. Perfect, perfect. Almost bang on time. You're so good. And also, never forget that we wake up with 35 trillion cells of our own on our side yeah. every morning. That yeah. We wake up with all this stuff. It's incredible. It's, it's great, incredible. It? We have 880 trillion effective transistors in our brains, greater, more complex than any computer that could ever exist. I suspect you may have some more, a few more than the, the average bear. <laughs> Arthur, thanks, man. Thank you, Chris. You're great welcome. to see you. You're oh, all, I love it's it. great to see you. Yeah. Uh, the Art and Science of Getting Happier. Build the Life You Want by Arthur C. Brooks and somebody called Oprah Winfrey. Virgin Radio.